remains the same from one zebra to the next zebra? What remains the same, the same from one dog to the next dog? What remains the same from one lion to the next lion? So sameness was the most important thing. Variation, the variation you observe when you look at a bunch of zebras, and you can see the camouflage patterns vary from one to the other. You can see some are a little taller than the other. You can see some are a little faster than the other. That variation was a smoke screen. He even said so himself. It's something that, that prevents us from seeing the sameness that is what our thought should be aimed at, identifying that common essence, that common essence that makes up a species. So for Aristotle, sameness or homogeneity was the key. Variation or heterogeneity was a nuisance, was something that you had to remove with your thought to arrive at that common essence. For population thinkers, it is exactly the other way around. Variation is the key. Variation is not nuisance. Without that variation, there would not be any evolution. So difference, heterogeneity, variation is the fuel of the process. If we had sameness, if any species ever managed to reproduce exactly the same and the next generation was exactly the same as the previous one and so on, it would stop evolving at that point. That would be the end of its evolution. It might survive, although I doubt it, because habitats and ecosystems are constantly changing and it would present that species with new challenges and if it doesn't have any variation to draw on to adapt to those challenges, it would eventually die. But you can imagine species that have been homogenized by natural selection, by natural selection uh, uh, over many generations, but nevertheless they are the exception, not the rule. So to summarize again, for Aristotle, sameness was the key. For population thinkers, variation is the key. And I'm, I'll get to you in a second. And this again introduces a keyword that's going to be a keyword throughout the morning. The word difference. For population thinkers, difference form of variation is crucial. And for Deleuze, who is an early adopter of population thinking, difference is key because he is the philosopher of difference. His main book, and the book that I most recommend for you to read, even though it's a very hard read, he pays in the end, his main book is called Difference and Repetition, with the emphasis on difference. You will see that the other two reasoning styles also are based on the notion of difference. And this is why Deleuze picks this reasoning styles for analysis, because they incorporate the notion of difference at a basic level. Yes? So process thinking, or sorry, population thinking is, appears to be a process, you know, something that occurs in time, a verb, and Aristotle seems to be describing nouns, you know, something that's not, to, it seems like they're not exactly comparable. Well, they are not exactly comparable, except to say that this is a departure. Well, it, 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 they are not exactly comparable, you're absolutely right. However, because they are, they are talking about the same thing, animals and species of animals and in organisms within, individual organisms within species, they are comparable, they're, they're, it's the same subject, but well, you're absolutely right. One is dealing with categories, generic categories, specific categories, and then individual cases of those categories, whereas the other one is not dealing with categories at all. Yeah, I guess maybe comparable is not the right word. It doesn't seem to me like they contradict each other. Well, they don't either contradict each other because remember, the contradiction is simply the negation of the other, and this is really a complete departure. You're absolutely right. But we still need to compare it to Aristotle because Aristotelian thinking dominated for 2,500 years. And, and Kant, uh, you know, ev ev just about everybody before Darwin continued to think about animal species as Aristotle did. The authority of Aristotle was so great, and deservedly so, I'm not putting him down in any way, I mean, you know, to, to write about these things 2,500 years ago, when there was nothing available for you to really draw on, it needs a, you need to be a very original thinker, you know, you need to be something that really came up with novel things. So 
So I'm not going to put down Aristotle because he concentrated on categories. Well, that, that, had, that was the starting point for everything. But what, once you understand his influence over hundreds of years, then you do need, you, you do feel that the, the need to cut in the umbilical cord, to put it, to put it with another metaphor. You know, we, we have that 2,500-year-old umbilical cord going back to the Greeks. Nietzsche had already criticized it when he said, we are all too Greek, meaning not Zorba Greek, but Aristotelian <laughs> Greek, uh, and saying, you know, we have to be less Greek. We have to be, you know, less in awe of the Greeks. We need to invent something new. But he was a voice, a lonely voice in the, in the you know, in the wild, you know. Nietzscheans did not appear until the 20th century, really. So, so despite the fact that you're absolutely right, that they are not exactly comparable, there's still that umbilical cord that we need to cut to be able to say, hey, this is what was taught for 2,500 years. We're going to start fresh. We're going to start with something new. We want to start with something that's based on process. I'm going to, I'm going to take a break in, in about 10 minutes, OK? But let me just first finish with population thinking, so when we come back from the break, we can start with a brand new thing. There's a second aspect of population thinking, and this is this. Species are historical. Born by speciation. Second difference with Aristotle, of course. For Aristotle, species were eternal. They had always been here. Of course, poor Aristotle didn't really have access to fossil data. He didn't have access to all the data we have access to today to, 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 to think, well, at some point there were no elephants, at some point there were no whales, at some point there were no humans. You know, he had access only to the, the available biological knowledge of his age, and we cannot fault him for thinking that. But nevertheless, today we know that species can be born and die. Let me explain how. Speciation is, is basically a process through which the gene pool of a particular species becomes isolated or becomes the, the, a barrier is erected between that gene pool and the gene pools of other species. Let me give you examples. We humans are entirely reproductive isolated from every single other animal. In what sense? Well, in the sense that even our closest relatives, chimpanzees, with whom we share something like 99% of our genes, our sperm cannot fertilize their eggs, and vice versa. Their sperm cannot fertilize our eggs. That's very strong reproductive isolation. We cannot combine genes. And when you cannot combine genes, it means that new genetic materials from other species cannot come into our gene pool. There, and that is what gives us our identity as a historical entity. The human species is not an eternal category, it's not an essence, it's just a historical entity that happened to be born the moment our sperm stopped being to, able to fertilize Neanderthal sperm, or Neanderthal eggs stop being or in Neanderthal sperm, so being able to fertilize our egg. Now, other species are not that clearly reproductively isolated. So, reproductive isolation comes in degrees. Take, for instance, horses and donkeys. Horses and donkeys can actually do it. They can actually have sex together. And sperms from horses can fertilize eggs from donkeys and vice versa. The only problem with them is that the offspring, a mule, is sterile. Mules are always sterile. So even though they can fertilize one another, they cannot really pass those genes any farther because the mules are now sterile and therefore cannot continue to pass those genes. So donkeys and horses are also reproductively isolated. They might be able to have sex and they might be able to fertilize one another.